My name is Brian Jacobs, and this is my Harman II, Harman Rocket II, uh, an incredible fast airplane. It's the big brother of an RV4. And uh, I'll start here with the fuel tanks. It holds 42 gallons, 21 gallons per side in the front of the tank. And it's got a very short wing. The winglet was made by the man that built my first airplane, uh, Oliver Brennan, and he decided he wanted to make something a little different. He designed this, he had it built, and now there are a lot of them around society. Uh, the, because the wing is so short, the ailerons, I don't know what they've done to make them more effective, but they are great. I love to go up and do a roll. I love to push it over to the nine o'clock and about a second and a half to two seconds later, you're level again. It's really fast. It's really fun, and uh, I love to do it. Um, I will say that I'm only going to do it with people that want to do it. Uh, I would never do a roll unexpectedly. You'll notice my canopy is tented, which is a wonderful thing in the sunshine of California. And uh, when you, you never get any clouds, so you're shaded. If you get it this way, though, night flight is not so easy. The back seater has their own stick. They can fly the airplane. I'll always let my back seater fly if they would like. Uh, the front seat has the controls. And how about if I get in? Okay. You do stand on the seats to get in. Don't be afraid to do that. Now, the instrument panel, about two and a half, three years ago, I replaced all of my steam gauges with a flat panel and lost about 45 pounds in the deal. I can turn it on and it'll take a few minutes to get up. It is an MGL. The man that installed it suggested it and I said, go for it. So that's what we've got. And it's wonderful. It is so nice to have a flat panel. Uh, I guess I get to climb faster without all the weight. I did not mention that the flaps are electric. When I got in here, I see my flaps up and down. And it's five seconds from flaps up to flaps down and retract back up. I've always enjoyed manual flaps till I got this. And now I'm liking electric flaps. We did have a bit of a problem when we first bought this. The transponder did not come and did not come. And after two months, he said, how about if we get a different model? So we did, and it's only half as wide, but it does the job just great. And yeah, and I do have lots of different pages to go to. And I guess hey, it's still working inside of the hangar. So you do have a lot of pages to choose from and you can Customize those any way you want. The mixture throttle and uh, prop are all over here. And it's just got a, a mountain of power. I would say if there's a bit of a problem, it's having your shoulder straps on and trying to change fuel tank from left to right because you notice I'm leaning forward to do it. And so you have to stretch a little bit to get left to right. Over here on the switches, my last switch is a landing camera. I can turn on a camera, which is what you see, these little two white stripes are just holding my camera still, and it shows me what's in front of me, because on the ground, I don't have forward visibility. So I put in a little backup camera to let me see what's in front of me when I'm uh, on the ground. The plane is built all aluminum. There is no composite on it. Uh, this was built in 1997, finished and flown in 1997 by Ted Rutherford. He also had built an RV4 before he built this. And he had a lot of great ideas in it when he built it. It is their standard construction. One thing that did happen was the elevator was built with 016 aluminum and it developed a little crack and so we replaced it with O2O. I understand that they're all built with O2O now, aluminum, so that doesn't happen. I also asked the builder to, the man that was helping me build it, to put 
silicone across the, the back. That was my idea of hoping it would dampen vibration and eliminate any possibility of bad things ever happening in the future. Now, why would something like that happen? Because this plane pulls a lot of G's. I've had it over six. It's rated over nine G's, and, uh, but I've never been there. I've been to six. Back on the tail of the airplane, the trim tab is so awesome. It's electric, it's on this stick up there. And so if I put someone in the back, it's gonna make a difference because I just loaded CG backwards and I can trim tab it right out so I don't even notice. I have a trim tab on the rudder as well. Uh, it pretty much stays put for forever. So, but it's electric as well and on the stick. Now the tail wheel is connected, as you can see there's springs connected to my rudders and it gives great control on the ground. Um, if you push it hard enough, it'll pop out and be disconnected from the rudder. Okay, one thing is I put my hand up here and I realized the height of the airplane is only five feet, eight inches. So it's no taller than me up there at the canopy. So it's a pretty short height stature. I guess that's where it gets a lot of its speed. And the uh, tail, the way the tail works, uh, I would watch John Harmon, the designer of the airplane, come over to the hangar. We would be out flying. He would come up to the hangar with what I thought was way too much speed, hit his brakes, kill the engine, spin his airplane around and release, and it would roll backwards into his parking spot. And I'm thinking, I'm still working on that. I can bring it up to the front of the hangar, hit my brakes, turn it around, get it ready, but mine never backs up. So I'll let that stay with John Harmon. The, um, Airplane is just so responsive to anything you can think of, it will do, even on the ground like that. The best way to move it around on the ground is from the tail. You have to open the canopy and push on the uh, roll bar to be able to move it forwards or grab the propeller. So it's a lot easier just to turn it around, get on the tail and walk it wherever you want. The tail only weighs about 80 pounds, so you can pick it up. It's not bad when it's empty. No, I'm not Hercules. I'm just an old, old guy. You can tell on the tail where we say that this is November 66 Tango Romeo, the Bakersfield bunch. That's because Ted Rutherford built it in Bakersfield, and they all went out together. We had people going out as many as eight of us all flying together to go to breakfast or not. And uh, you could always find at least one. There would never be less than a pair going out to breakfast. We'd go from Bakersfield to California City, to Porterville, to Fox Field. We would go to all these different places down there uh, for a breakfast. On the way over, we just flew pretty much straight and level. On the way back, we usually followed the terrain. There's nothing like going down a creek and following the creek whichever way it goes. And this plane will do it. He can even do it up the hill. I'm not going to recommend that to anybody else, but it will follow the creek up the mountain as well. Uh, the, uh, we have a fairing that fits over here nice and tight. I thought that was pretty neat. You undo the back ones and you can slide it forward when you do your annual inspection. You have access to everything in there. You'll also notice that uh, Ted Rutherford put the time machine on it. This plane is just so fast that time goes backwards when you're going somewhere. So this is called the time machine. And it is a Harman Rocket II. You'll also notice that we do have our static port here and on the other side. They come in and connect together and go on up to the instruments. Uh, but now that I have so much electric up there, it doesn't do a whole lot anymore. Coming over, we've got the, you do not get on on this side, but then the canopy folds open and you wouldn't have access anyway. Coming to this particular aileron, this reminds me of, I had an incident a year and a half after I bought the airplane. I flew up to Arlington, Washington. A guy wanted to go for a ride. I said, sure. I took him for a ride. We come back. We do a perfect landing on the numbers, and at the time, another airplane is landing midfield. So we're coming down like this. He lands at midfield, I land on the numbers, and then the right side of my airplane just goes down. I had broken a landing gear up inside the motor mount. The wheel sat underneath the wing and held it up. So 
it uh, wasn't a problem. So this wheel pant right here went up under the wing and just held the wing off the ground just a little bit. But when I was all done fixing everything, put in a new motor mount so that that would never happen again on the titanium landing gear, everything is ready to go. I go take it for a ride to see how it's doing and my right wing is so heavy, it just pulls over. I cannot go over maybe 170 miles an hour. It's, the wing gets heavier and heavier. So I come back and land. John Harmon is there and I'm telling him, I just can't take this. It's, it's just the wing has fallen and I don't understand. He took a two by four piece of wood and a big hammer and he went back over here to this aileron. He set the wood against the back of it and hit it. Now, I'm new to airplanes, and he hit it again, and hit it again, and he hit that piece of wood against the back of the aileron. I'm having a heart attack, and he says, there, give that a try. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. What did you just do? He says, I just flattened the back so that the cord would be smaller or whatever it was. I took off in the airplane. I could go over 210 before I got the same weight. And so we did a few more adjustments, and now it flies perfectly level. I could not fathom someone walking up to an airplane and hitting it with a hammer. So it sounds more like a Disney movie. Okay, again, we have 21 gallons on this side for a 42 total. So it outlasts my wife's and my bladder when we go cross country. We're not going to fly that far. The landing gear... Uh, again, I got a learning experience here. When I lost my landing gear because of the incident and I put on new landing gear, well, I went for about two months without fairings and uh, wheel pants. I had to have full throttle on this airplane to keep up with the other rockets. While they're backed off to 75 or 70 percent, I'm 100 percent power trying to keep up with them. This adds 20 miles an hour to the flight of the airplane. Just the uh, leg fairing and the wheel pant. It's an incredible increase. Okay, now that I've talked about the speed there, that how much it costs me to not have uh, good airflow, let me tell you a little about the engine. My engine when I bought this was an IO540 rated at 320 horsepower. John says, you can fly this on 90 horses. And he says, if you want to try it sometime, Give your throttle up to about 15 inches of manifold pressure and don't touch it again and take off and see what happens. You'll think you're in a Cessna. So uh, at full power at uh, 2,800 RPMs, it gets going really fast. A few white lines and you're already in the air, even with a passenger. And the other day I took off here in the winter, it's cold, and Ben was in the back seat and I said, you want to immediately climb or stay down low and get some speed. He says, get some speed. So I'm probably doing 160 by the time I get to the end of the runway. I nose up and Ben says over my shoulder, you're doing over 5,000 feet a minute climb. Uh, oh yeah, I guess we are. <laughs> so it's an incredible engine. However, uh, two years ago, I had to have the engine rebuilt and I went from 10 to one compression to nine to one compression. I wanted to get a little more life out of my next engine. So I'm at a nine to one compression and they're telling me I should have about 300 horsepower with this new engine. So I've got a new engine, a new cockpit and uh, everything is going well. Now that we're at the front, I do have Ram air. Now it's got filtered air that I use below 2000 feet, but I have Ram air, which has got a butterfly valve that's controlled from inside the cockpit and I can open it up and it'll give me about two to two and a half inches more manifold pressure when I do that. So going up high, you've got all the power you ever want. The propeller is an 80 inch Hertzel, 80 inch diameter. If I'm going to go cross country, I will go up to altitude and I have little oxygen bottles and I will go up to anywhere from 11 to 14,000 uh, feet of altitude and bring the fuel burn back to under 11, about 10.2, 10.5, and I'll be getting 245 miles an hour 
when I came from California to Texas, my average speed, including ground taxi and everything, when the engine was running, was 245 miles an hour. So uh, quite an impressive speed, which means I was going a lot faster than that when I was just covering distance. Uh, another thing for me that was a real novelty was taking off the, ca uh, the cowlings that you undo a bunch of screws there, a bunch of screws here, and you raise up the top. Then you have to pull out a few pins and a few more screws off of the landing gear and up on the front to take the bottom off. And uh, one person can do it. It's a chore. Two people, it's really easy. I do want to say one other thing about flying it. One thing, I had a friend that uh, really liked doing some rolls in the airplane. And he said, can you do a vertical roll? And I, yes, I can. But I go up to at least four or 5,000 feet and uh, get my speed up. And then I'll just nose up with full power, uh, ram air open, and I'll do a complete roll. Now, because I'm going up and losing speed, I'll come over on my upside down and then roll back up so that my engine never loses its oil because it's not rated to fly inverted. Now, you'll also notice that my wife is very proud of me, too. She made this for me, and incredible woman. Okay, when you're doing rolls and loops, make sure that you're wearing parachutes, and the back of the seats come out really easy, so there's room for a parachute, and it just becomes the back of your seat. Um, and... One of the things that we've noticed back in Bakersfield where there were a lot of Harman rockets, fighter pilots seem to be the main people that want to buy them. They are so responsive, so quick, that when you're normally flying, you don't move that stick hardly at all. If you want to do a roll, like I said, you just push it over to the 9 o'clock or the 3 o'clock and you're going. It responds extremely quick, extremely crisp, and does exactly what you want it to do when you want it to do it. That's it for the Harman Rocket, and I really enjoyed showing you parts and pieces about it, and I hope you love it and have a chance to fly in one someday.